All right, everyone, I think we're going to get started now. Um, first off, welcome. Uh, my name is Professor Christopher Damian. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies here at Cal uh, and the incoming chair of the Center for uh, Research on Social Change. Uh, a few uh, housekeeping items before we begin. Um, first off, I think uh, yeah, there's flyers for our upcoming events uh, somewhere by the entrance, um, in the entryway. Um, so if you'd like to uh, know more about the events we have, please join our, our email list. Um, also, I ask that everyone please turn off your cell phones. Uh, the the uh, talk will be recorded today, so we don't want any distractions. Um, and on terms of the format, Professor Dumas will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll, it will be followed by a Q&A that I'll moderate. So with that said, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Michael Dumas, who's an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Education and African American Studies here at UC Berkeley. Professor Dumas' research sits at the intersections of cultural politics of black education, the cultural poli uh, political <coughs> economy of urban education, and the uh, futurity of black childhood. His recent publications have appeared in such journals as the Teachers College Record, Race, Ethnicity, and Education, and Discourse. He is currently lead editor of a forthcoming special issue of Teachers College Record titled uh, Political Economy, Race, and Educational Inequality, Realizing and Extending the Radical Possibilities of Gene Anion. Uh, he is also the lead editor of the 2016 Politics of Education yearbook, uh, which will appear as a special issue in educational policy uh, de uh, dedicated to the cultural politics of race. Uh, Professor Dumas earned his PhD in urban education with an emphasis on uh, social and educational policy studies from the CUNY Graduate Center, and his uh, title today, or the title of his talk today, will be uh, "Moments of Refusal: Thinking Through Anti-Blackness and Black Futurity in Research on Urban Communities and Schooling." Uh, so, please join me in welcoming Professor. Dumas. Good morning. Uh, or afternoon, I suppose. Uh, so I have a lot to get through today, um, and I hope that you're able to follow along. And I've put some of the more um, dense text on the screen, so it's easier maybe to read along. So I want to thank everybody for coming out um, to spend some time thinking with me today. And I especially want to thank Dr. Deborah Lustig for inviting me to speak and to serve as an affiliated faculty um, of the Center for Research on Social Change. Very much consistent with the aims of the center, my work centers on the lived experiences of black children, families, educators, and activists in urban communities and schools that are deeply affected by political economic transformations locally, nationally, and globally, and by the social formation of race and racial politics, broadly speaking, and then more specifically blackness as a cultural politic and as a way of being and moving in and through the world. So this talk is called Moments of Refusal, thinking through anti-blackness and black futurity in research on urban communities and schooling. There's a lot going on um, in that. <laughs> and I want to spend um, some time discussing anti-blackness as a concept and as an area of theorizing in black studies or perhaps what we might call critical black studies or critical ethnic studies. Uh, black futurity speaks to a black possibility, a black imagination, a black freedom in the midst of, in spite of, and against anti-blackness. And then finally, drawing from um, some of my own work, I want to offer some thoughts about what all this means for inquiry in urban communities and schools. So first I want to um, explain this notion of refusal. Uh, here I'm inspired by the work of Eve Tuck and Kei Wayne Yang, who have been concerned with how we come to create and disseminate knowledge about indigenous folks, black folks, queer folks, and other groups who have been, and I quote from them, simultaneously hyper-surveilled and invisibilized, made invisible by the state, by police, and by social science research. In a recent article, they offer refusal to settle colonialism as an analytic practice that addresses forms of inquiry as invasion. That is, what does it mean to understand research and the interest and attention of others outside of one's group as a potential practice of violence, of invasion or conquest, and how can that be refused? Tuck and Yang insist that refusal is not simply saying no, rather, Refusing the colonizing code of research is an analysis that must come after, before, and beyond coding. It must precede, exceed, and intercede upon settler colonial knowledge production. Refusal demands exploration of questions like, who gets to know? 
Who gets known? Where is knowledge kept and kept legitimized? Who, what knowledge is desirable? Who profits? Who loses and pays, gives something away? Who is coerced, empowered, appointed to give away knowledge? So here, following Tuck and Yang, I'm thinking about moments of refusal as a way to foreground how refusal is always situated in a specific time and place. Not here, not now. And indeed, we are in a specific historical moment with regard to blackness and anti-blackness. Well, every moment, of course, is specific, but in this midst of Black Lives Matter, um, itself a response to so much black death and coming as it does during the administration of the first black president, I think we are particularly aware what time it is, even if it isn't clear yet what it means to be in this time. So I'm going to begin with this moment um, and an initial refusal, in part because it speaks to where we are now in anti-blackness and equally important because it is related to our imagination of black children who are so much at the center of anxieties and interventions in urban education. So here we have an image um, that's been circulating um, as part of a larger story um, that's gone viral in the past few weeks. So I've learned that this is Officer Tommy Norman of the North Little Rock, Arkansas Police Department. Dubbed Officer Friendly by other officers in his city, he has an active presence on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, which mostly features videos and images like this one showing him eating, dancing, and laughing <coughs> with residents, mostly children, almost always black. This particular image is, used, is usually posted um, on social media with commentary praising Officer Norman as a good cop, sometimes with a plea for more officers like him, or offering a more specific call for implementation of more vigorous community policing policies across the nation. But most often, the message is that it is time to stand with police officers, and that far from being racist, most officers are like Tommy Norman and actually have great affection for people in the communities they work in, as we can kind of see here. He's giving them junk food. Um, <laughs> th this then is presented as a heartwarming image and at the same time a defense against a political movement that is perceived to have placed black lives above the lives of the police officers. To refuse this image altogether, to refuse the emotional attachment it demands, is to understand that the production and dissemination of this image at this historical moment is intended as a defense of state-sanctioned violence against black people. This image means that most cops are good, and therefore, most of these killings and beatings of unarmed black women, men, girls, and boys are justified. The violence against black people is deserved. This image goes further and offers the white male cop as the father figure to mostly unclothed and young black boys, who here, in contrast to the fully clothed professional white male protector, evoke the construction of black children as pickaninnies, wild still, without parents, roaming the streets, but mostly harmless, adorable, witless. I'm showing you now these two images from the late 19th century, one in the US South and the other one in Cuba around the same time. In both, we see that the children are actually described as pickaninnies. Um, so what time is it for black people? What moment is it to be in 2015, which is also 1899? So, in refusing this image, in refusing to have one's heart warmed, one becomes subject to charges of being pessimistic, or perhaps, as we shall see, Afro-pessimistic, of doubting the potential of building bridges of understanding to approve so-called race relations, of denying that white people like Tommy Norman are generally committed to racial equity. And I respond by insisting that the image in its dissemination becomes violent in its disruption of political efforts to assert that black lives matter, and in its rejection of the veracity of black death and disregard at the hands of the state and its agents. But there's something else here, something that speaks to analysis of the urban and to the reproduction of racialized economic inequality. As I thought about this image, I became curious about the material conditions of black people in North Little Rock, Arkansas, and what I suspected might be stark differences between the lives of black people and white people in that suburban city which is a little over 50% white and about 40% black. And as it turns out, the poverty rate for black families is at about 26%, which is three times the poverty rate for whites in North Little Rock. 34.5% of black children in the city live in poverty, compared to only 9.4% for white children. Black unemployment is at 10%, while white unemployment is only 4%. Low birth rates are more than double for black children. Home ownership, 30% higher for whites. 
And finally, the concentration of poverty in elementary schools, 75% of black children go to high poverty schools where just under 50% of white children do. And some of those are probably actually in the schools with black children, but in segregated um, higher tracks. Uh, so in the, the moment in which racial images such as this are produced and disseminated is not just a cultural political moment, but always also a political economic moment as well, a moment in which what is at stake is the question of black life and the certainty of black death within urban spaces. So anti-blackness is the central concern and proposition within an intellectual tradition uh, or project known as black Afro-pessimism. And I want to note that not all scholars who theorize anti-blackness or engage with Afro-pessimist ideas actually identify as Afro-pessimist. Um, I highlight scholars here who identify as Afro-pessimist, but also um, scholars whose work informs Afro-pessimist theorization of anti-blackness. So in short, it should just be understood that there is no singular theory of anti-blackness and as such no list of tenets or principles that might be said to unify all those who intellectually wrestle with anti-blackness. Assume that I'm bracketing some of the tensions and disagreements for the purpose of our discussion today. There's much longer conversations to have. And I'll, I'll engage a little bit of the tension here, but not too much. So anti-blackness denotes the social disregard for and disgust with the black body and the denial of black existentiality. At the center of this theorization is the proposition that the black cannot be human and in fact exist in an antagonistic relationship with the social world. This relationship becomes forged through slavery in which the black as slave is positioned as without human form, agency, or capacity, but is instead the fungible property of whites existing not only for forced labor, but also for pleasure, for exchange for other goods, and to facilitate accumulation and settlement of indigenous land. Through chattel slavery, Frank Wilderson argues, the world gave birth and coherence to both its joys of domesticity and to its struggles of political discontent. And with these joys and struggles, the human was born, but not before it murdered the black, forging a symbiosis between the political ontology of humanity and the social death of blacks. This social death of the slave is introduced most explicitly in the work of Orlando Patterson, who detailed how slavery involves a parasitic relationship between slave owner and slave, such that the freedom of the slave owner is only secured and understood in relation to power over the slave. For Patterson, slavery is, and I quote, the permanent, violent domination of natally alienated and generally dishonored persons. So alienated from birth. Although slavery involves personal relationships between groups, it also operates as an institutionalized system maintained through social processes which make it impossible for the slave to live, to be regarded as alive for her or himself in the social world. In this formation, white supremacy depends on and is in fact parasitic on violence against the slave, whose suffering is never legible because one piece of black property is of no more or less value than another. There is no inherent human worth in the black body. As Sadia Hartman explains, as, as Sadia Hartman explains, as property, the dispossessed body of the enslaved is the surrogate for the master's body, since it guarantees his disembodied universality and acts as the sign of his power and dominion. Thus, while the beaten and mutilated body and pres uh, presumably establishes the brute materiality of existence, the materiality of suffering regularly eludes recognition by virtue of the bodies being replaced by other signs of value as well as other bodies. I'll explain that a little bit more. So in this sense, white entitlement to dominion over the black is facilitated by the denial of black subjectivity. It is not that the black is exploited or abused, it's that the black is incapable of being exploited or abused. Thus, even as the material suffering of the black is readily observed, it can just as readily be dismissed as not really possible since the slave, as the possession of whites, cannot suffer on its, in this case, own accord, as a being for itself. Finally, then, there is no need to protect the life of the slave except as it benefits white accumulation. The fungibility of the black body means that we needn't care what happens to a given black person because another black will serve the same function. Anti-blackness requires the state to act to contain black bodies to serve the desires of whites and protect them from the inherent damage 
of proximity to black bodies. In her discussion of Plessy versus Ferguson, the 1896 US Supreme Court ruling which determined that black people were not entitled to share the same public facilities with whites, Hartman argues that the integrity of the white race delineated the public good. In other words, public was constructed as white and black was imagined as the enemy, not just of black people, but against the freedom of the white public to live unencumbered by blackness. Basically, Hartman explains, the wholeness of the social body was made possible by the banishment and objection of blacks, the isolation of dangerous elements from the rest of the population, and the containment of contagion. Scholars who theorize anti-blackness insist that all chattel, chattel, although chattel slavery is no longer legal, with the huge exception of US prisons, the social relation of master-slave is still constitutive of the relationship between black and white. That is to say, the black is still positioned as slave, and the relations of power remain unchanged. Hartman's understanding of black fungibility resonates in the face of the data on persistent black poverty and economic stagnation, and at a moment in which Black Lives Matter must be asserted as a political proposition. Anti-blackness is, in a real sense, a kind of political economic imaginary. The master-slave relationship inherently positions the white as participant in the market and as entitled to consumption and to pop property. Historically, the black body has been white property and the object of white consumption. Even now, black bodies are expected to perform as whites desire. And part of that desire is that black bodies not be obstacles to white consumption and accumulation. As Tiffany King theorizes, black, body, black fungible bodies are the conceptual and discursive fodder through which the subtler master can even begin to imagine or think spatial expansion. Here, black bodies serve as symbols of infinite flux able to be manipulated, moved, and discarded at will to serve the interests of white domination. The, this imagination of black bodies as fungible, what Hartman calls the afterlife of slavery, justifies not only a metaphorical settlement on and in black bodies, but also the expansion of white colonial settlement in its material form. In this way, geographic spaces in the city and in urban schools become claimed for white settlement as well. Anti-blackness, even when not explicitly voiced, is always embedded within the political and uh, economic imaginary of white entitlement to educational spaces and resources. So a bit on black futurity, which is in a theoretical and political sense the future of blackness, almost, I guess, denotatively, right? And I'm, I'm going to begin there, but then I also mean black futurity to mean something very material and very practical, and that is an insistence on black life and black life going on, including black life in cities where we are being pushed out, um, and in schools where we're not wanted and where our resources are being taken away. So what does it mean to go on and keep doing the work? So here I turn to Fred Moten's loving engagement of Afro-pessimism. Although Moten hesitates to call himself an Afro-optimist, he wants to make space to consider life and optimism over death and pessimism. This is part of a longer um, ongoing conversation in the field, and for the moment I just want to embrace Moten is offering some ideas that offer us um, how we might respond, a way to respond to anti-blackness, how we can refuse, and to do more than just say no. So Moten explains, if Afro-pessimism is the study of this impossibility of blackness being loved or lovable, the thinking that I have to offer, and I think I'm as reticent about the term black optimism as Wilderson and Jared Sexton are about Afro-pessimism in spite of the fact that we make recourse to them, moves not in that impossibility's transcendence, but rather in its exhaustion. Moreover, I want to consider exhaustion as a mode or form of, or way of life, which is to say sociality, thereby marking a relation whose implications constitute, in my view, a fundamental theoretical reason not to believe, as it were, in social death. Right? So he's kind of contesting that notion of social death. And he goes on to say that our aim even in the face of the brutally imposed difficulties of black life, is cause for celebration. This is not because celebration is supposed to make us feel good or make us feel better, though that would be, there'd be nothing wrong with that. It is, rather, because the cause for celebration turns out to be the condition of possibility of black thought, which animates the black operations that will produce the absolute overturning, the absolute turning of this motherfucker out, and that's a reference to um, Curtis Mayfield, Celebration is the essence of black thought, 
The animation of black operations, which are, in the first instance, our undercommon, our underground, um, submarine sociality. Ultimately, Moten says, I plan to stay a believer in blackness. And this belief, this celebration is part um, of what can and must be a part of refusal, which is, as Tuck and Yang remind us, always more than just saying no, even if no is all we can say at the moment. So I want to turn to my own work to offer two different examples of how I've been thinking about how to refuse anti-blackness in urban education. So the first piece is under um, review for a volume which takes up the significance of Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century for the Analysis of um, Educational Inequality. And in my article, um, Justifying School Inequality, Anti-Black Imaginaries, and the Cultural Political Economy of Urban Education, I contend that in the U.S., and particularly in this neoliberal moment in the U.S., the justification of educational and more broadly economic inequality is about defending white entitlement to material advantage and entitlement to always win. I argue that this entitlement can only be imagined within a social reality in which black people have lost and continue to lose. I explained that by focusing on black emotional, moral, and intellectual culpability for their own educational and economic condition, and not honestly accounting for the influence of social and economic policies intended to advantage whites at the expense of people of color, we create a powerful economic imaginary that is largely devoid of collective will to include the black as a legitimate recipient of economic support. In fact, economically centered interventions become derided as throwing money at the problem. If the problem can be understood as based in some kind of black cultural deficiency or behavioral maladaptation, then we have no responsibility to entertain economic proposals or solutions. Further, constructing economic investment in urban schools as throwing money evokes familiar anti-black racist images of the undeserving black reaching out hands, greedily taking something that, that rightfully belongs to others. At best, Appeals for allocating material resources to predominantly black and brown urban schools are based in empathy. That is, researchers, policymakers, and advocates highlight abject learning conditions, crumbling, dangerous infrastructure, and limited access to college preparatory and arts courses and extracurricular programs to garner support for additional funds, which are often in the form of corporate donations, charity drives, or scholarships offered to a small number of exceptional students. This empathy rarely leads to sustained efforts to rethink the allocation of educational resources or to critically examine, to, to critically examine how whites benefit from housing and school assignment policies that reproduce white material advantage. And most troublingly, empathetic identification with poor black children and their underfunded schools can be, as Hartman says, related to both the devaluation and at the same time the valuation of black life. So Hartman explains here, that the economy of chattel slavery precluded developing emotional attachments. However, even in the system, black life can be valued in ways that reify devaluation. So empathy often proceeds by asking whites to imagine themselves in the same dire situation as the black. And it is always the most dire situations that are offered here. The reality of systemic maldistribution of resources is not enough to sway hearts. In education, then, we have to present the most tragic circumstances usually endured by the most ideal and compliant black students, and often with the most respectable parents. There must be evidence of pain and despair. For example, sitting in overcrowded classrooms or with rote curricula, that's not really enough. Um, it's unconvincing. It's kind of unsatisfying. We need more. For Hartman, empathy with the slave is often motivated by white wonderment that anyone could survive under such conditions, and therefore reinforces the notion that the slave is not human. Further, this empathy usually involves a substituting of the slave body or the black body with the white one, such that if the focus shifts from a recognition of black pain to a centering of what it would mean for a white to endure the same suffering. Mm -hmm. Hartman explains, um, we need to consider whether the identification forged at the site of suffering, is that, am, I, am, one I, am I one ahead? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Hartman explains, we need to consider whether the identification forged at the site of suffering confirms black humanity at the peril of reinforcing racist assumptions of limited sentience 
in that the humanity of the enslaved and the violence of the institution can only be brought into view by extreme examples of incarceration and dismemberment or by placing white bodies at risk. What does it mean that the violence of slavery or the pained existence of the enslaved, if discernible, is only so in the most heinous and grotesque examples and not in the quotidian routine of slavery? So recently we all kind of noted that um, the black bodies that have been killed and shot, they show, you know, laying on the ground for four hours, um, showing the, the video over and over again. You almost have to see it in its worst case. You have to die. So all the cases where people don't die, we, we're over those in a day. It just has to be extreme in order to get any attention to black life. So calls for empathetic offerings of educational resources are also susceptible to devaluing black life in another way, through celebration of efforts that assist a few with absolutely no intention to support transformative economic policies that would improve schooling conditions for the great majority of black children and communities. Here it is the fungibility of the slave that allows one to stand in for all. By helping any one given black child or minority school, the empathetic white receives credit for addressing racial inequality and the public collectively imagines that all black children have thereby been helped. Thus, says Hart Hartman, Yes, thus says Hartman, while the beaten and mutilated body um, presumably establishes the brute materiality of existence, the materiality of suffering regularly eludes recognition by virtue of the bodies being replaced by other signs of value as well as other bodies. It is the fascination with black suffering and the ensuing political spectacle of economic aid to the black, the endarkened child or community or school, that allows a symbolic largely voluntary approach to school resource equality in which something, anything black is offered aid um, without intent to systematically interrogate or resist the racialized maldistribution of capital. Economic and educational inequality are justified because the white public is offering something to some fungible black bodies somewhere at any given time. So the analysis I offer in this article is intended primarily as a refusal of anti-blackness in racial neoliberal discourses on school inequality. The second piece I want to um, highlight is a recent article in the journal Race, Ethnicity, and Education. And this takes a different tone. It's not nearly as dense. You'll, this is more my effort to actually introduce actually real black people speaking into this discourse and not just theorists. Um, so in this article, I drew on data from my historical ethnographic study of the cultural politics of school desegregation in Seattle, which is my own hometown. I explore suffering as a recurring theme in the narratives of four black leaders, educators, and activists um, involved in the struggle for black educational inequality in, over the past 30 or 40 years in the post-civil rights period. I contend here in this article that for many black children and families, schooling is a site of suffering. Not merely suffering, but I believe it's the suffering that we've been the least attentive to or willing to acknowledge um, or give voice to. So I want to share just two of the narratives from that piece which highlight not just black suffering, but also a refusal of anti-blackness imbued with a commitment to black futurity. So first person here is Annette Perfect. Uh, this is the narrative. Sitting on the hardwood floors of Mrs. Bunny Wilburn's living room one afternoon, I talked with Wilburn and three other women, Annette Perfect, Edith Giles, and Zakia Stewart, about their years of activism leading the work of the Seattle chapter of the Black Child Development Institute, an organization with a long history of education advocacy for black youth and parents. One by one, they introduced themselves. Wilburn, who's the eldest, speaks first. A retired nurse, she describes how she made the choice to send her daughter, who had attended parochial schools since kindergarten, to Roosevelt High School in the North End in the 1960s during the years of the Voluntary Racial Transfer Program. I wanted her to get a sense of the real world, Wilburn explains. Also, black leaders were encouraging members of the community to send their children to North End schools. The North is primarily white, and for a long time, you could not move there if you were not white. Uh, I like to see myself as somebody who's down for the cause, she says proudly. Psychologist Zakia Stewart was next. I have to say that Bunny nurtured me and Edith radicalized me, she says laughing. Sitting next to her on the sofa, Edith Giles laughs. I ain't radicalized nobody, she says playfully. Both of Stewart's children are adults now, but much younger than Wilburn's. She speaks about benefiting from the earlier generation's experience in integrated schools. As she asked around in the community in the mid-1980s, the assessment was bleak. The academic piece was, was missing, she explains, and it seemed that if you put them on the bus, 
That meant they were going to be suspended at one point or another during the school year. I made a conscious decision not to send my children there. Edith Giles, who was a teacher in the Seattle schools for many years, is also retired. I had met with her a few weeks before at the local senior center, and she helped arrange this day's discussion. She had made her perspective very clear at our first meeting. This is her. One of the things we as a people don't understand is that even among the majority white population, even those who support us, they're only going to go so far. They have an agenda. That's just how white folks are, and black folks don't seem to understand that. The buck is going to stop there, and it's going to stop on their side of the fence. Even though there might be broad support for reforms, such as school desegregation, she said, there's a whole other agenda, and maybe they're not even conscious of it, but it's there. We need to figure out what we need to do for us, making our own decisions without being dependent on anybody else. Since Giles and I had already had an initial conversation, we all turned our attention to Annette Perfect, who until this moment has been sitting quietly, listening. Now she puts her head down and begins to weep. Someone offers her a box of tissues. After a few moments, she looks up. I'm sitting here listening to them, she says slowly, and we're all different. They have husbands. I'm a single mother with two sons who have been through the Seattle School District. And the big picture, the big picture for the United States, America, they, whoever it is, they have a plan, we have a plan. I want my kids to be able to read, write, do math, get a job, take care of their children, hold a decent conversation. But they feel because I'm a single parent, my kids are less. I'm not interested in my kids, and because I'm a single parent, their father is either a pimp or a drug dealer or some wonderful thing, and I'm sleeping with anything and everything in the street, and I don't care about my children. I don't know where they get this from. I care as much about my kids as they do, but I have to fight all the way from day one until she pauses, searching for the words. They're in the box. She begins to cry again. I feel they work very hard on black males from the first day they go into school. The other women nod and say, mm-hmm. I've worked at the school district, she says, noting her many years as a cafeteria worker. I'm retired, and I'm working back in the school district, and I'm seeing the same plan there as when my kids were there. But it's more out there, and they don't care. Again, that notion of time, since it's actually her understanding being worse now. Perfect remembers the day her youngest son got suspended from Eckstein Middle School, a, de a desegregated school in the city's predominantly white north end, which I was also bused to around the same time. What was the story about this, she says, sighing. Okay, him and the little white boy were out on the gym floor. My son had the ball, and the white boy wanted the ball and said, give me that ball, nigger. And my son done the way he was trained. He whooped his ass good. And he better, because that's how I trained him. He better not go to school and start no fight. But if it starts, he better end it. I laugh knowingly. Yes, I tell her, nodding. My mom told me that, too. That's just the way I am, she says. They suspended my son for three days and didn't even tell me. She took her son to school the next day and to confront the principal. I asked him, what happened to the other child? He said, I had to take him home and explain to his parents why he had a bloody nose. But nobody came to my house. Nobody called me. Nobody said a word. So anyway, I looked at my son and I looked at the principal and I said, yes, he did exactly what I told him. If anybody ever calls you a nigger in life, you better whip his ass and whip his ass good because if you don't, I'm going to whip yours when you get home. And the principal did not understand that. But I said, he's not going to lay down and let somebody walk all over him. He better not. I got a bad attitude, she says, laughing bitterly. But I've got two sons and I'm trying to get them grown without them going wherever it is we go, to jail or wherever it is. And, and Elnora Hookfin. So Seattle schools recruited Elnora Hookfin from historically black Grambling State in the mid to late 1970s. She was my former home economics teacher, and it was terrible. Well, it was, she made it a wonderful experience in the end because she made me do that pillow, that stuffed pillow <laughs> that um, I resisted. Um, so she was my former home economics teacher at Eckstein Middle School in the early years of the busing program, and she spent most of her career working in the affluent and mostly white north end of the city. But I found Mrs. Hookfin, deep in the South End, beginning her third year as vice principal at Rainier Beach High School. I have worked in the North End forever, she tells me as we sit in her office, and I wanted to see what was going on, and this is one of the schools that was struggling. I could have retired yesterday. I don't have to be here. I want to be here. She tells a story about how during her first year at Rainier Beach, she noticed that one teacher would allow large groups of students to sit at the back of the class braiding each other's hair. I had to put a stop to that. I'm reminded that a few days before our interview, I had stumbled across quotes from Rainier Beach students on an online website, greatschools.org. Most had been posted a few years ago around the times that students had staged a protest over the lack of textbooks and other supplies. So I shared this one with Mrs. Hookfin, a student. Nobody listens to Rainier Beach. They think we are only good for our sports. 
If we had things to let us work better academically, like books, computers, and better teachers and tutors, then we would be an above average school. I work hard at my school and nobody recognizes that because they are too busy recognizing how much better other schools are. Just because we are a primarily black school doesn't mean we can't learn. Teach us. I don't want to leave high school knowing almost nothing. Please give us some things to make us learn. Why get up so early to be treated so stupid? I hope somebody reads this. Let me address that, Mrs. Hookfin said, suddenly sounding stern, because the kids are so right on with that. They were working with ancient computers up until two or three years ago. They've been updated. We do need a stronger curriculum. We don't have that. However, she notes, black students and other students of color are still marginalized throughout the district, not just at Rainier Beach. This is still going on. We talk about closing the achievement gap, but we have to take a look at what we're doing to our kids. And if you go to a school, say, a Roosevelt High, which is an affluent school in the North End, Roosevelt's going to take care of the honors kids, but the other kids, they're probably going to end up on one wing, on a floor all by themselves, and they're going to let them tear it up. Garfield is guilty of that, too. Although they have the largest AP program, they also have the largest group of misbehaving students because they plop them together and give them the worst teachers who cannot gain control, who are not motivated, who are not educated. So her voice trails off. We never really desegregated, Mrs. Hookfin says. We remain a sophisticated, segregated system. How do we do that? We came up with something called the honors program. So kids were bust, but they were not placed in honors. And kids were bust and placed with some of the worst teachers we had in the building. So the segregation had its advantages and its disadvantages. It helped the big picture. At least you were able to sit on the bus wherever you wanted to sit and go anywhere you wanted to go, that kind of thing. But as far as education, it was not fixed because teachers are still teaching in a segregated way. Remember how we were talking about the kids allowed to sit at the back of the room and do what they wanted to do? That's all part of that. Until we fix that kind of teaching, we're still in a segregated system. Students at schools like Rainier Beach, she insists, are not going to have the same educational advantage that, say, Roosevelt has because we don't have the money. So the kids that have the money backing are going to get the best. So we're right back. I think we're worse than we were before we desegregated. It's ugly, but it's real. So there's a lot to analyze in these narratives, and I do much of that work in the article. I, I just present them here as testimony to the ways that black subjects interrogate and refuse anti-blackness and then continue to believe. Um, so this work is always theory and flesh, theory and bone, theory and soul at the same time. So I want to close by offering a few thoughts about what I think this means for urban education research. It's the least I can do. Um, and there's so much more that can be said. So for me, it becomes important to situate all narratives of current black suffering in schools within the broader context of an historical trajectory of constructions of the uneducability of black people. I'm kind of struck by that, this notion that throughout slavery, there's a sense that if you're not human, you really just aren't even capable of being educated. So it's not just that you're not getting resources, but there's actually a kind of legitimacy of the idea that you really cannot, you're not secretly in the back, you're not really that smart, you really aren't capable of being educated. Um, so I think that that still hangs over us here. Um, so be, in the afterlife of slavery, it becomes important to see how imaginations of the ignorant, dangerous, dark, savage move and shift over time, but the relationship of master-slave continues. Second, I argue that we need to foreground a structural analysis which understands educational inequality in other moments and now as largely the enactment of white settler colonial accumulation and hoarding of educational resources. And within that materiality, the white imagination of the presence of black bodies as impediments to progress. Black students and families must therefore be kept in their place, which is to say, in other places, in inferior places. <laughs> And third, I just want to say that I refuse to make linear sense of it all. Anti-blackness makes no sense, and therefore it makes no sense to presume that it has any linearity, which is to say a logic which necessarily makes this moment better than what has gone before. I want to begin with black educational imaginations as expressed across time and in relation to different times, different senses of time, thinking forward from W.B. Du Bois's cautions about school integration in the 1930s to black sense-making about segregated schools in East Oakland in 2015, thinking back to Reconstruction in the 1860s from the calls for community control in the 1970s and again in the 1990s. What do black people want? What did they imagine that education would do or could be? How do they remember? What stories do they tell about the past? What stories did they tell about the future? My work has to refuse Linearity, because in my conversations with black folks who experienced school segregation, desegregation, resegregation, they refuse that linearity as well. Their remembering moves back and forth across time. 
what we need to do now, what we didn't know then, what we have forgotten, white people do not change. For all of us interested in social change, what thinking about anti-blackness and black futurity offers is neither absolute pessimism nor liberal optimism. Rather, we are struck by the realization that there is no end to suffering or struggle because there is no end to desire to maintain oppressive relations of power. We will be here in another historical moment having a familiar conversation refusing all over again. So thanks, Alec. I really appreciate your uh, talk. Um, so much of this uh, neoliberal discourse uh, is actually, um, on, at least on the surface, blaming the schools and the teachers for um, for failing these youth. Um, it's um, it's commonly seen as an attack on black education, and yet um, the um, the purveyors of the discourse will say we are the ones actually trying to defend. Uh, mm -hmm. black students and, and black families against business as usual. Um, you, maybe you could speak on how that might be similar and different to um, or relate to this older discourse of, oh, they're culturally deprived, they're hard, to, they're hard to reach, they're at risk, it's really difficult to teach them, and we have to give these schools a break for, for, for failing. Um, to the extent that they're related and different, and why, why that might be significant. Give the schools a break? Um, the idea that the, the, there's an older idea that still exists that you have to, you have to give these school teachers mm. a break for, for having low test mm -hmm. scores, for instance. Because, you know, look at the students, you know, they, look at the homes they come from, mm. right? Mm -hmm. But now the neoliberal discourse right. uh, is almost going in the opposite direction, even if it has some of the same policy um, mm -hmm. effects, uh, right? Right, so that actually then teachers and schools are being held accountable yeah. for the... And, 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 and teachers have to defend mm -hmm. themselves and say, hey, these kids have a lot of issues, mm -hmm. you know, it's not that easy right. uh, to teach under these circumstances, so, uh, you know, right? Right, and it, it, it all gets complicated because... Um, I mean, I say I work in a graduate school of education. I've worked in education for some years, and in many ways, we do graduate people who are not ready to teach in the com those communities. They, they don't understand mm -hmm. what they hold on to all sorts of racial biases, and so they actually research shows that they actually are more likely to have biases against you know students of color. Believe that they're less you know um, capable. So there is that right, um, and at the same time, there is the the larger kind of political economy that shapes what kind of economic conditions children have. You cannot sim simply fix people within schools. Um, and so in the neoliberal discourse, you have to fix things, right? There has to be kind of technical or managerial solutions. And so the school has to then be constructed as this place, this site that through various application of various kinds of principles of efficiency will somehow produce these um, products at the end who will be um, ready for their place in the market or in the workforce. Um, so there is this kind of push then to hold schools accountable for this. And, that, and yeah, you're right, I think that scene, uh, some of you already know this, but that scene as really almost uh, an instantiation of civil rights. It is the new, the new movement is to actually, you know, it's, what did um, George W. Bush say? He's going to counter the low bigotry of, I don't know, the, the soft bigotry of low expectations, right? So in using that notion of bigotry, he's kind of nodding to racial bigotry. So in other words, I'm opposing racial bigotry. So the state gets to present itself as being, um, as, Malamud is officially anti-racist. The state is on the side of racial progress um, through um, both holding um, what they would call accountability, but holding schools on some level culpable. But there's also a cultural discourse at the same time that holds children and families um, as ultimately responsible or as having some kind of cultural deficiencies that are also... Um, but obviously the attention then shifts totally away from any sense of the public good or, or kind of public obligation to... Um, invest in schools. And also it becomes ahistorical in ignoring all the ways that we've allowed public education to allow for the hoarding of um, educational resources for those who already have those resources. So it's a really twisted um, scheme. It's, it's hard to intervene in all the places that are speaking just the right way, right? So how do you speak about um, a critique of what happens for um, black and brown children in schools, the, high, the suspension rates, and all, without also then demonizing those public institutions, right? And actually even demonizing the idea that we need public institutions. So it ends up then reinforcing 
um, that the private sector could handle this better. Um, so, yes, Mike. Is it Thank Dr. You. Leonardo? <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, so ever since I talked to you about your use of suffering, I've been really compelled by that term. Mm. And this semester I'm teaching a class where one of the papers is to read about the concept of oppression. Mm -hmm. Probably some of them were in this room, so they, their ears might perk up. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm really interested in your turn to suffering, mm -hmm. right? Because that losing an arm in another decade could have been called schooling is a site of black oppression. Mm -hmm. But you use suffering. And I'm really curious as to what you think the purchase is in using the concept and word, because I think it's more than a word for you, yeah. It's suffering, and, and is it tied to some politics of refusal thing? Right, so it's two parts to that, I think. So in that, in that piece, um, it's tied really to um, Pierre Bourdieu's use of the notion of la petite misère, this notion of ordinary or everyday suffering. We think of grand suffering, so you, you have the kind of grotesque, you have Kozal's work, right, which documents just really, you know, drastic situation, things that would just make, you're supposed to make your heart turn and you're supposed to cry and all that. But, and those things we actually think are reprehensible. But there's everyday forms of suffering, a kind of um, what he calls school malaise, um, where you actually, you're going and you know that this really isn't worth you going. And you know that they really don't want you there, but you have to keep going every day. So it's the everyday business. It's the smell of the school building. How many of you um, um, go back in your old school building and you remember a whole bunch of things? So if you had a really wonderful relationship with that school, then it's going to evoke all sorts of wonderful memories and a sense of likeness. If every day or there are certain days, you remember where you got beat up over here, you remember where this teacher said you weren't going to ever make anything out of your life there, and um, so you, re you remember all these things. And so that, that kind of everyday notion of um, pain and, and so there's that piece, right, the everydayness of it. The other piece of it is the collective notion of it. So I actually I went looking for um, a theory of suffering. Um, you know, um, what is Bell had to say she went, came, um, came to theory because she was hurting, right? So you, you go to theory because something's already happening. And I was like, I'm trying to make sense of this. And I said, oh. and for those of your graduate students, often this is how you accidentally discover things. Like, I wonder who's theorized the suffering, but no, you know, there's the psychological literature, which is mostly around trauma and individual experience of that. And then in the sociology of suffering, it's very much this notion of the collective. Uh, and what does it mean to collectively identify and understand you are a group, uh, there's a we who suffer, and then, on the other, and then you also construct a narrative of a they who are somehow doing the suffering to us. And then there's something we, ought, whatever that we is, and there's also that discussion ought to do about that, right? And how do we make sense of that in our lives, right? And how, in a sense, do we go on? So it's definitely connected to notions of futurity, in, in, even in just what I just said, the sense of constructing, as Moten is trying to do, the sense of like, okay, I, I, I see all this. As, as the people in Seattle said, look, this is just how white people are. They're, they've been this way. We should have known it. We, we open up our hearts a little bit. They prove themselves pretty much to be the same as they've always been, hoarding the resources, saying one thing, doing another. Um, and, but that's, that's life, and we've got to keep going on. Um, and so we've got to be happy about it. We've got to find ways to laugh in it. So there's that kind of collective, like, how do we actually survive and thrive in the midst of suffering? So there's that. I don't know if I... Yeah. Oh, Good. Okay. A little, little time. Uh, I was very interested in your ethnographic data, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, what, would there be an opportunity to interview some of the students, or do you know how the students experience this being shunted into the right. less, you know, down the corridor as you right. it, right. et etc.? And is there any, at any level, is there any resistance to this by the students themselves? Did you find anything along those lines? Well, this is an interesting thing that, as you think about historical moment, right? So that, that, that most of the people that I'm talking to for this are older by the time I'm, you know, I, I think I said, I met one woman at the senior center, right? These people have been activists for years, or they've been educated for years, or um, they've already put kids through the school system. So there are people, and this is the thing, was my teacher, right? So I'm of the generation that um, a lot of people are interested in, in terms of the pe first group that was part of the mandatory busing program in Seattle. I didn't really mention all that context, but in the late 70s, the, the voluntary program wasn't working because white people were not willing to volunteer to um, integrate. And so the, with a threat of a Supreme Court case, um, then the city created its own um, busing program because they didn't want the courts to have to do it. And so Seattle, in some sense, boasts that they're the um, first city to implement 
um, desegregation um, on their own, voluntarily. But it really wasn't voluntarily, because um, the ACLU, the NAACP, were all threatening to file a lawsuit, and they were going to win it. So, um, so people, a lot of people are interested in that, people, the, that group that started with the busing program in 1978, 80, 81, and so I remember those days on the bus. And I wrote a, lo- a little bit about them in that article, um, my own experience in a little auto-ethnographic moment. Uh, so we experienced that first way. But people that they're talking about now are those who are really in schools that have resegregated, um, that where we've largely abandoned, the busing program was dismantled over years and over years. There's even a black turn um, away from the busing initiative as, we, as mm-hmm. they pointed to there as we discovered that it really didn't, improve conditions for black children um, all that much to be in the integrated school setting. Um, the official narrative, though, is going to be that it did, right? So you've got the work of um, Amy Stewart-Wells and others who have gone back and interviewed um, graduates um, of the very school that I went to um, and a couple others who basically, she did this in the wake of the 2007 Parents Involved Supreme Court case, which pretty much dismantled Brown altogether and said that you couldn't use race in school assignment. And she said, well, let me interview the graduates, people who went to school around the time that I did it, and get what they have to say about their experiences. So here's what she's doing. She's interviewing people in 2007 about things that they experienced in 2000, I mean, in, in 1980-something. So there's that notion, that, and I faced this in my study, what people say 20 years later about something they experienced, and especially when you talk about suffering, suffering is this everyday suffering, I need to have you in your everyday to really, if I talk to you 20 something, your memories are totally different and also they're, they're shaped by what you believe you ought to say mm-hmm. and also by whatever dominant narrative there is around diversity or multiculturalism or whatever now. So she interviewed, um, and here's the interesting thing, she, and I don't mean to, touch, but it's a really great case study in how you do research design and it goes back to this, to Tuck and Yang's notion of like, how do you collect data and who gets to speak? So, she couldn't get um, access to everybody who went to the school, so she used the email listserv of the Alumni Association to find graduates who had graduated. How many of you are still on your high school email listserv? Um, now, what it means is that that's going to privilege people who have probably a warmer experience of the school. One, they had to have graduated, because if you don't graduate, you're probably not on your high school listserv. It's embarrassing. Um, and, and if you did, you still, some people are like, forget, I'm done with that. So that's already the, the subset. And then they have 45-minute interviews, some on the phone, some in person, and I'm not sure how they did the racial ma- ma- match in terms of the re- interviewer and the interviewee. Um, but she did get a lot of people from a, a few specific schools. And one of the things that um, the white students um, said, they both said that it was great. I'm glad I had a diverse, you know, I'm glad I had an integrated school setting. Um, now, what she didn't really ask them is whether they're actually in the same classes together. Because most of those schools are very, what we call integrated school. Um, I, I was there. Um, and, you know, and I was one of the, the only little black kids in honors. And so I'm in um, ninth grade honors um, health science biology. And next door is regular biology, or what we actually call bonehead biology. So going back to that educability piece, right? And bonehead biology, as it was called, was mostly black and brown kids coming up. So after the classes let out, our class would let out, their class would let out. And so, so I, you'd have to be in that. How would I interview people? In that, I, one, I, I lament that I don't think anybody was really, I couldn't find any studies during that time of how young people were experiencing it at that time. Right? And there's a lot of studies later, um, and there was one that did, I think she did do it around that time or very shortly afterward, is a dissertation called Rhodes Scholars. Get it you know, on busing? So she, it's like a play on Rhodes Scholars, but it has nothing to do with it. So anyway, they were, it's cute. Um, but, so they were on the, they, they, and this is in Seattle. Her dissertation was based there. But what she mainly celebrates in that dissertation is that um, white kids got introduced to um, hip-hop dancing, to fade haircuts, um, there's not as much going the other way around, the other side, in terms of what black like, kids got out of it. But there's definitely this kind of sense of like, wow, it was really great. And what, um, in another article I wrote, um, one of the city council members says, hey, what was really great about it is it actually, um, school desegregation actually hastened um, gentrification. He wouldn't have, because it made white people less afraid of other parts of the city and of other people in those mm-hmm. cities. So in many ways, black people benefited by being scary um, for a longer period of time, even as that also meant disinvestment in the neighborhood. So there's always this, that catch to it. Um, so I guess to answer your question, 
historical memory is a weird thing. So when, when do you when do you talk to people? What do you want to know from them? And so I kind of, I just embraced the idea of historical memory. I just said I can't. I, I, this is not what they were at that moment. I can't get that. I can't recreate that moment. And we didn't do the research then. So I guess it speaks to the, we need to always be doing research, right? Because we may need something 20 years, you can't get it later. Um, and then what does it mean to just embrace historical memory? Let me think about, um, and then embracing historical memory, I had to then think more about futurity because it's that your memories of the past that are shaping present and future. So mm -hmm. I really, my work that I thought was going to be all very historical ended up being more present and future. And that's also the way people talk to me about it. There's, during, as I was writing the dissertation, um, this was a couple years after Bill Cosby had his moment at the NAACP benefit where he said that, you know, the lower economic people, and lower economic black people, and this is his direct quote, are not keeping up their end of the bargain. Um, that the, all they want is $500 tennis shoes and, da -da -da, and they should be getting hooked on phonics instead. And so it was very much a kind of um, um, p black pathology thing. And he got a lot of big claps and um, one of the and so it really kind of showed this rift between the black um, upper and middle class and then kind of the black poor and this kind of sense of they haven't done this. And so some of the people that I was talking to about the past were um, reluctant to embrace Cosby, but there was this sense of um, they were looking at what was happening, trying to make sense of the, the persistent inequalities in schools almost without acknowledging the current suffering of kids mm -hmm. in schools. Um, so they kind of they said, well, I don't want to embrace Cosby's explanation, but I'm upset some way that somehow we didn't do this, right? And so think about this in terms of who I was interviewing. One of my mentors um, told me that I was going to have a problem, that I was probably going to end up getting too many middle class and upper middle class respondents if I was talking to people who have been educators or activists, or whatever, because many of them have then gone into... Um, government jobs or moved up in the school hierarchy and they had also gotten wealthy because they moved into the black neighborhood and bought homes back when the, they were um, less it didn't cost very much but now they accumulated a lot more wealth and their children had you know moved on and they were no longer activists now many of them um, other than like Mrs. Hickman is still in school um, and that perfect is still active but some other people it's something they had done years before and so they really had distanced themselves from those who were in schools right now. Um, and because of gentrification um, and kind of urban, the, the black community there is so gentrified now that many of these people don't even live in the city limits anymore. So they can't really have an active role in the politics and the way they're dispersed. It's not that they all live in one new place and have created new memories, they're just dispersed and they don't see each other anymore. They don't think collectively in the same way anymore. So a lot of their, all this is complicating <laughs> um, doing that kind of work. So this question really is a continuation of what you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Is there any possibility of you turning this study into tools that would benefit students in the high schools right now? And I am struck by the fact that like such a study and Claude Steele are here at Berkeley, but Berkeley High has the highest um, efficiency gap of any city in the country. And you know these tools, and I know that they don't know anything about these ones. Mm -hmm. I know that they don't know anything about who Claude Steele is. Mm. And you know, so these students who are there now and mm. these would be such wonderful tools to help them see themselves as like, real students and understand mm. what's going on with them aren't benefiting from these like really brilliant studies that are so very close to them physically. Um, I think it's not a criticism at all, but just the possibility to turn these things into tools that you can share with high school students and so you're thinking about, because there's so many different sites of intervention even within a, a school, right? So there's get, somehow giving this information to high school students. Um, is that in partnership with also then engaging the kind of power structure in the school? Or do you think it's something that could happen independently that we wouldn't even need to change the structure of the school, but that the students themselves would benefit? Who, of course they would benefit on their own, right? Anything well, would be a benefit. I know that um, Berkeley High has an African American Studies program. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're studying in our African American right. Studies program, but right. to understand how the country is got the education for you, mm -hmm. I think would be really beneficial for them in using Claude Steele's um, stereotype threats, how you can overcome yes. some of these ways that I think would be very beneficial for them to hear before they become grad students. So what do you think it would do on its own? I mean, because. Well, I remember when I was a student, we had a thing called Gates, mm -hmm. and I was a part with a really, really high 
small school. So mm -hmm. There were four of us, and teachers didn't know how to deal with me when I came in. And there were these little clues that told me that I was supposed to be something different than the kind of student that I was. Mm -hmm. That I was supposed to be someplace else in that ground. Mm -hmm. You know, when I when I played on the football team, and I remember my coach calling me back to remind me or to ask me if I knew that I had the highest GPA on. Of course I did. Mm -hmm. I've been on the football team for four years. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you know this? Mm -hmm. Why was it such a surprise for you? And I remember. Like all through my like academic career, having these little clues that I was in the wrong place, mm -hmm. that there was something. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm an educator, when I go in and students will talk to me and are brilliant, and then when I ask them to sign up for science programs, they won't sign up. Like mm -hmm. African American mm -hmm. children won't sign up for science mm -hmm. programs because they've been told for so long that they're mm -hmm. bad at science. Mm -hmm. And if you go to a festival like the there won't be any African American families there. You wonder why not and where they are. So it's because they don't know these things that this has been set up for them to act this way. I think if they knew it would really change the way they saw themselves as students. So I'm thinking about that within something larger. So it, it, as a as a standalone, because often what happens is we say, um, what is this a problem of? Right? So what is the pro and so if you are, and understand the problem primarily as a problem of lack of motivation or lack of um, internal kind of um, awareness or consciousness. Or if, just not having the tools. Right, yeah, so, so lack of um, a certain kind of social capital or something like that, right? So, so, so that, and then if we, so if that's how you di diagnose the problem, or, and, and again, I'm not saying that there's only one piece, but if that becomes the thing you foreground, if that's the thing that you're going to tend to, and you're not doing anything else, because what happens is that often these initiatives I'm thinking of my brother's keeper is the biggest example of this, become um, fetishes in themselves. The sense of like, um, the problem is this, and therefore we, and then we, we're off to the races, doing that one thing, right? And it becomes the thing. And the danger of that, if, if, the pro, if it's primarily that, um, and again, it's, you can say it's not, either, it's not either or, it can be everything, but it's never, discourse is power. You know, so that, so that when, it become, when that narrative holds, then that becomes the narrative. And to the extent that what you're um, saying supports what's already a hegemonic narrative about the problem being located in the bodies of black children, I'm, um, I want to be supportive, but in the, I was gonna, I'm always going to put it in the context of something larger in terms of, so that, let's say we do that, but you're still hungry. Um, or, and I'm not, and yet, I'm not saying you would say that, but that becomes the danger politically of what happens is that the... Um, the approach that is most consistent with neoliberalism is, that becomes the one, and, and most consistent with how we, the dominant formation of like what we think of black people are, becomes the one that everybody wants to fund. And so you'll get all this funding for um, bringing in inspirational speakers like Claude Steele and da da da. And, and here's how I know, it's done. And there's actually a book, um, it's been done several times, but I'm thinking of Sean Jenright's book, Black in School, which is actually a study of a, it's a school in um, West Oakland where they decided to do a whole Afrocentric curriculum. They were going to give all sorts of inspiration. They were going to bring in, they brought in the big names in you know, black studies to come and speak and do all this. They, they overhauled math. Math became you know, um, Africanized. Was, and it turns out most of the kids in East West Oakland were like, what is this mess? What are you all doing? This has nothing to do with my everyday life. And most of the people who came and saw the speakers were Berkeley people, and middle, the black middle class came and spoke. Yeah, I'm not talking I know you're not. I know you're not. I mean, like, right. turning it into, into classes. And right. To be hungry is to be better than to not be hungry. To, like, thirst for life. Mm -hmm. To want to know what right. is the next step. To ask that right. question. I think even that is a really good place to start. To have, to make them hungry. Make them want to know yeah, that there needs to be a next but, step. But why start? The, see, this, this is the great thing about thinking about temporal and, like, what I, what I meant by moments, right? Or kind of linearity, because often we think of that like we, we got to start somewhere. It becomes a very dumb thing, right? But then the way we, we always start is always with the thing that we're going to end with. We're not actually going to go anywhere from there because we've been doing that <laughs> motivational kinds of things, inspirational things, and and it comes in waves. It's not, and, and you're right. We're not doing it now. Um, I want to do what you're saying, but I don't want to start there. I don't want to call it a start. I want it to be part of something that's no not, that's not the beginning, not the end, not located in time in that way, but that it's part of a holistic kind of approach that says, okay, we're going to give you tool building things, but you're also going to look at your discipline policies in the school, we're going to actually think about, um, and we're going to hold, you know, educators accountable for really kind of transforming how they think about black students. We're going to think about 
um, affordable housing in this area so that people are not having to um, be moving out of this area and their next semester they're up in Antioch or they're over in so that kind of so you're going to have to have a house it's going to be connected to housing affordability it's going to have to be connected not just to saving the children but you're going to have to think about how the families themselves in terms of their own economic stability so I want um, I don't want Quad Steel to just come alone um, or me to come alone and say you know inspirational things or give tools to kids without knowing that there's other investments that are being made at the same time I don't want to do my thing first because what will happen is I will do that and there, you will never get to the other things because the thing that this and, and then we'll be having the same like I said we'll be having the same conversation um, again and because actually Berkeley High I know um, somebody who used to be here um, Pedro Nagara major research was had a long research project at Berkeley High in the 90s, I believe it was in the 90s, and maybe into the, right? And they did a lot of work, and they did a lot of work of the kind of that you're talking about. And it was probably very great work. It's probably a lot of great work that was done. But you, as you say, it's not changed. So, or, or what counts as change? Or, and I'm not saying that nothing great happened then, but what does it mean to, to be in this moment now when that moment was the diversity project was supposed to be so transformative in so many ways? We have to think about what was done, what wasn't done. And I know even Nagaro's come around thinking about, a lot of people have been talking about this broader, bolder approach, right? This notion of situating school, um, you know, kinds of base programs with a whole range of other um, economic and social, you know, supports that would be needed. So I'm, I'm all for this, but I want to make sure that the young people and the adults are not um, getting heartwarming feelings about um, that happening. Because that... I know, I know that's what you're saying, but I, you it's know. It's like saying I would rather not give them the tools because I don't know what kind of culture they're going to go. If you, either you don't mm -hmm. give them the tools or you do give them the tools. Okay, uh, yeah. so we get some few more questions in one hand. Yeah, um, I was just, uh, just thinking very hard about some of the things you're saying mm -hmm. and the, the way in which you're, you're talking about a different temporality, temporalities of suffering. And, and the ways in which this, this work has you know, the potential, and it is already moving us away from um, thinking about this linearity, right? Um, and questions about if, if we are refusing linearity, how your work talks about futurity, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that is alarming also, right? But I, I really like the way your work is not doing that, not thinking linearly, but actually distending by focusing on the moment of suffering, which is all these multiple instances of suffering. And whether that is a framework to help us think, to rethink and, and to think about all well, the social actions we need to do or the, the social, the theorizing that we need to do, right, and concrete things we need to do about black suffering. I wonder if you have any thoughts about right. if this was legible. Right, and I'm going to link it back because I, I feel like I've, I think that a lot of things we do are not necessarily different than what we would have done. So, for example, if somebody says, hey, we'd like you to come and speak to our group, you go and speak to the group, right? And you say, and you give it your all. But you realize, your consciousness is, this, one, I understand how this can be co-opted um, by the system. So I'm going to still do it. I'm going to still do it. I'm still going to go, right? So I, I still understand that we may still be in this moment 20 years from now, that, that this is not some kind of linear progress. My activity is not going to necessarily lead to that other thing. And I also am um, politically conscious enough to know how it can be co-opted by the system, how it can be um, absorbed within, and, and, they, and they'll boast about it, but, and nothing will really change. And I'm, I'm getting older. I feel like, I don't know how many, how many of you feel that you're getting, um, <laughs> that you now have enough years of adulthood. Like I, I now have more years of adulthood than I do of childhood. Um, and so, and you start thinking like, you know what? We're still having the same conversation. I was an adult and I had that conversation 20 years ago, and I'm still having that conversation. And what does it mean to kind of refuse to be having the same conversation 20 years from now? Um, in a way that I think we thought things would naturally progress. So at least as they start, or so these are other temporal, like, well, um, things get, it gets better. Um, to, yeah, yeah, right? um, and, and part of that is it will naturally, either naturally get better or um, just light a candle and then every, each one reach one. Um, and these kinds of, those are all temporal notions of how social change happens. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to be old enough to say like, no, that's it's something, there's something else. And it's not that you stop lighting the candle, it's not that you stop doing it, but you are also simultaneously pursuing some other kind of, so you're, maybe you're existing in more mo modes of time 
of Tamarai at the same time. You're like, I'm here with you right now doing this concrete work in the school, teaching this, being with you, supporting you, and then I also want to think about this other long, t- this other kind of trajectory that has gone all the way from slave, in this case, that's one moment to start, and, and, and continues on. And so I want to interview Dean at several mo- um, moments, or in several modes at the same time. So yeah, if I'm, if I'm just theorizing this, then I'm no, of no use to the students at Berkeley High, but on the other hand, I don't want to stop the theorizing, because the theorizing allows me to think about time outside of the concrete time on the... Oh, right, so... You said that maybe that helps. I don't know if that helps or just makes it more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> complicating is good. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Hi. Thanks for being here. Um, I have sort of a scary and personal question. Personal for me and personal in terms of your answer. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that there's room for white theorists, activists, educators to be conducting research on this topic? If not, where do you suggest those efforts be better allocated? If so, what are some precautions and recommendations in that way? And it asks in some ways for a universal answer, like or a theoretical a answer, right? Yeah. That like so part of what I think is motivating your question is some understanding of the um, tensions of kind of you know, um, well, the, it, for all of us, notions of positionality and research, like who am I to be doing this research? From what point, from what place am I doing this? And then on the most simple level, anybody who's teaching a critical qualitative class will say, you know, any, it doesn't have to be that critical. What biases do you bring into the research, right? So, and, and in some ways, what's implicit in your question is the sense that whiteness becomes this position from which to do this research. Um, and what does that mean? to come from that position, right? Um, and and are there, is there anything universal we can say about that? That for every white body doing this research, then these will be these things. Uh, and then there's, you said it was personal, because in, in some ways my, the answer has to be personal, right? The sense of who am I to do this? The, the, but, you know, but you're not just individual, you also then become embodied by whatever kinds of racial you know, um, identifications we might make. So I think that all those things are going on. There's the broader thing, and then there's you, what your own history is, and since I've just met you, I don't even know I don't even know um, how you personally racially identify. You, you didn't speak about it necessarily. It's like, I am a white person, so I can't even assume that. So all that is going on, and I think that, um, am I evading the answer? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no I, I, think, I think what I, I, th- I think it's loaded because it, you said this kind of work, and I'm not sure that um, you would have to think about what your project is. So one could do work on anti-blackness by interviewing white teachers. Um, and, construct, and one might choose to do that. Now, if you're choosing to say, well, I'm going to do work on anti-blackness and I want to interview you know, black children around this, and you have to think then about what is my positionality in relation to those black children, what am I likely to hear, um, what am I likely not to hear, um, so who am I to do this work? What is emotionally driving me to that work? Um, and what's perhaps not driving me to um, look at anti-blackness from a, in all in other spaces, right? So um, there is a concrete answer, but it's it's built in the specificity of you know who you are and how you're entering this work. Yeah. yeah. Um, Professor Dumas, there's a move in a lot of school districts around the country, and specifically in Oakland, um, called restorative justice mm-hmm. to intervene, right, in yeah. school discipline issues and also in this education project. Um, and in some ways, other than the individual recognition of traumatic harm, mm-hmm. there's also been this collective recognition of the harm of black and brown children and their experiences of schooling. And I'm just wondering, I'm wondering how we might make sense of that sort of recognition of suffering. If it's a recognition of suffering, how can we complicate it if the aim is to restore children to a structure of white entitlement. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if that's a re, you know, no, no. redundancy in that, but right. in terms of, yeah, I'm just trying to, right. to make sense of this because mm-hmm. in some ways, it's also being directed by a lot of black practitioners, mm-hmm. black workers, right? So, yeah. So I had a doctoral student at NYU who was also working around this, who's still focused on this issue of restorative justice, and you used in, in a sentence, and I think that becomes interesting to think about what is restorative, what is the restoration that's supposed to be happening? Mm-hmm. Right, so what, as you understand it, and you use it there, and maybe you could just repeat that, what is to be restored in restorative justice? Mm-hmm. What, what, is, what is the aim? Well, it, 
it seems like the aim would, would be to restore children back into school, to keep them in school, right? It's because the children, the, the rhetoric is that children are being pushed out of school. Mm -hmm. They're being disciplined. But the act of discipline is itself also a focus, right? So it's like how, um, I'm just trying to understand it as, as, an, ins as an insistence of black suffering, mm -hmm. but it's an intervention that it seems contradictorily restores children back into a space of entitlement. Right, right. It, it, and it, I love these questions as much as I love yours, be, not be, and, 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 and kind of interrogating them. It's not that I'm like opposing them, it's just like I, they're questions of practice. And so I'm, I'm grappling with how do you bring theory to this right. practice. And so as I've talked to the other student about restorative justice and this notion of restoring people to school, well, why were they not welcome in, or why, why, did the, why were there, was there um, a rupture between the relationship? So it's not really re restoring the relationship somehow or understanding what it is. I think it's what was the problem that actually alienates, you know, these children from school. And then re restoration movements are usually about healing and about kind of, I think, of re truth and reconciliation. So what truths and what kind of things need to be reconciled um, that are more fundamental than just, like, locating the problem in the, still maybe locate the problem in the body of that person and you need to be restored to this? No, what if you have to restore a sense of um, humanization to the actual system itself, right? What if that's where restoration needs to begin? Maybe it's not located in that body at all. So, the, so one of the things I challenge that student is to think about, how are, yeah, how are you all conceptualizing? I love the idea of restoration. I think we have to stay with that. But let's follow that through. Who needs to be restored? Because often you're being restored to your own humanity, right? And to the extent that anti-blackness actually you know, is a kind of white imposition of non-humanity by white supremacy, then maybe we need to restore whatever kind of sickness that that's about and kind of delusions that are there and then we can do other kind of restorative healing work. So it just shifts the gaze of restoration. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, actually, heard of her asking a slightly different question mm -hmm. that makes me kind of connect to some other things that mm -hmm. were being asked, which is about this idea of um, how do we think about these different forms of recognition of suffering that do kind of proliferate around schooling and school reform that, as you've noted, is this process that never ends. Mm -hmm. um, and so and it makes me come back to a question I had about a comment that you made in passing that schooling had not, hasn't been thought of as a site of black suffering enough or very commonly. And I think these comments kind of point to, and even, even some of their own thinking, points to the fact that that's actually not true, that it really what we're talking about is a multiplicity of recognitions of suffering that um, need to be thought about in structural terms, that there are, if there's an economy. And that's how I would answer this question about what, what is this theory of suffering that I hear you pushing for. And to me, it sounds like you're pushing for not an individual psychological mm -hmm. account of suffering, but a, 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 a mass collective psychological account, but even beyond the psychological, that there's this connection between the political economies um, and the moral economies, right? Mm -hmm. I use the mm -hmm. term moral economies, mm -hmm. other people, moral economies of suffering. So that, that's, I think, an important piece to account for. I do research around schools, so I'm familiar with that dynamic, that there is constantly this appearance of the recognition of suffering mm -hmm. in you know, what was once called desegregation fights and what's mm -hmm. called, in this, this gentleman's example, the No Excuses movement, or what's right. being developed even in debates and tensions among different incarnations of restorative justice. Mm -hmm. And that gets in the way of the clarity of thinking of scholars and of students mm -hmm. and, and teachers in Berkeley High. So that expanding that, I think, follows from what you're saying, that there are being able to talk about the different ways that black suffering gets recognized within these economies. Right, I think one of the challenges from the Afro-Pessimist tradition is that, um, that black suffering gets rendered unrecognizable or illegible because um, we're still having debates about whether black people are human or not. So in that case, they aren't even capable of suffering or their suffering is a thing but it's not actually, you know, it doesn't really affect our lives. We can kind of move on. Anyway, it's not, they don't live in the same way we do. 
They don't have the same kinds of capacity of life as we do. And so you get a lot of language about um, restoration or harmony or reaching out. But, but really, there's some, some people said, do you really love the children? Do you love them um, in the way that one, it, are they capable of being loved? And who, and, and, and that's a challenge from the theory. And we, and we certainly, I think, in our lives, well, of course I care about all my children. Of course, that's the kind of, and, and of course we care. Of course, of course, everybody's equal. I see everybody the same. I mean, it, and the theory actually suggests that mm, we really haven't moved past that kind of relation in, in the broader social world. So the, the school is structured in that same way. And so, and the results, the material results, seem to kind of back that up. Um, because here we are 20, 30 years later, and we're not seeing... I mean, look at North Little Rock, look at Berkeley High. I mean, so, so the theory is suggesting that there's something more fundamental than simply um, recognition. Um, and it does tie, yeah, this notion of, of the distribution of resources um, to the sense of these people are not worthy of resources. They're not worthy of that. What can they do with it? What is their potential? So that's, that's so I think that that's a... Um, fundamental thing I think we have to kind of struggle with um, still is what do people really think about black children? What do they really think about black... And if they love little black children like Officer Friendly here, <laughs> do they love their parents? Because I don't think you can love black children if you don't love black families. Um, and if you don't love black communities. So what does that mean? Um, and so that's, that's what we'd have to grapple with. I'm not convinced. So, um, I actually have a question. Oh. <laughs> So I want to preface it by saying I'm a political scientist. I know nothing about this literature or a lot of the concepts uh, you're, you're discussing. Uh, but um, so first, I think I want to start with making sure I understand uh, one of the, uh, the foundations or the premises of, of your argument is that you're saying that uh, that the black suffering literature tends to focus on, on extreme examples when somebody dies, right? and you're more interested to more in kind of like the uh, in the more everyday forms of, of oppression within an institution. Like School, right? Is that kind of, do I understand that part? Yes, yes, and it's not so much as the black suffering literature, but I would say that our, um, that efforts to actually get some kind of empathy, even, even in political efforts, to actually garner empathy for, you know, black suffering, have to focus on really extreme examples, um, okay. and not really the every day. Okay, so, um, all right, I understood that part. Um, Throughout the presentation, you kept using terms like uh, settler colonialism, said black and brown youth, black and brown students. Mm -hmm. um, but and I think theoretically, you draw brilliantly from like this experience of the black suffering and explaining it. Uh, but I'm interested in like the, the black and the brown. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like um, I'm wondering if how in this research, if you're drawing so heavily theoretically on the black experience. Mm -hmm. um, do you engage at all with, or how am I engaging with, say, the history and theory on like? Indian schooling or mm -hmm. farm worker schooling, right? Um, impact your analysis or your experience? Because you know, I don't, I mean, it's perfectly, I think, relevant to explain right. the black student experience. But if you're going to be saying black and brown, how might it impact your analysis to, to engage with those other directions? Right. In my use of black and brown, I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, um, kind of urban education, kind of schools that, uh, more thinking not so much in terms of theory, but actual people in classrooms and kind of some people that might be having shared experiences of. Um, educational achievement or lack of access to textbooks and things like that. Yeah. I think that um, um, Latino kids are actually affected by anti-blackness very deeply um, in terms of, and partly because they're in the same communities and, or it can be raced in a way that is seen, seen as closer to this. I'm thinking of a friend of mine who moved from Peru to Washington, D.C. and one of the first things he was told is, you know, don't hang around with the black people. Uh, and also don't hang around with the Salvadorans or one of the other kind of, so there's this kind of sense of who's been racialized black and that's all so I kind of I think I still think that you know it's got Nakagawa's is that black is the ful fulcrum it is, is kind of the thing that's, that race spins on it's kind of that whiteness um, is parasitic on and then others are kind of often positioned raced in certain ways as, so in every group even among Latinos there's a sense of like being dark it's kind of closer to black you have the Cuban Pickaninnies, and so I think that there's a necessity to theorize the specificity of blackness that does not necessarily mean um, that you know black lives matter more or something like that. Uh, but but that that specificity becomes important to bring even to kind of broader um, understandings of diversity or racial diversity or black and brown. Um, so I, I think that that becomes important. Yeah, I, I just ask, I feel like that's a very East Coast way of thinking and conceptualizing race. I feel like on the West Coast, it's never been solely like 
white supremacy has not been solely based on the black experience. There's a huge literature on uh, mm -hmm. racial fault lines. Uh, right. You know, but that's the that's, history of the you know, yeah. differential racialization that I'm not sure we right. can kind of exp explain the, you know, the Latino urban educational experience through solely black lens. I think there's a specific No, I wouldn't do that. Right. There, yeah. right? So, mm -hmm. But I also often, often hear people say, like, uh, especially with, like the education, I think, and prison literature, black and brown this, but then they're solely mm -hmm. theorizing from a black perspective to right. explain it. Right. So I'm just wondering kind of like how... Uh, well, that's part of, that. yeah, I, I think that's very important. And I think that's one of the reasons I tend to be more specific. Um, and I think that a lot of us for, um, in many years, you know, black and minority were the same, when we use the word minority, and people would use those things interchangeably. And so there's definitely this kind of concern about a black-white binary, right? That race is only seen in terms of black and white, and then other people kind of got left out in terms, and so there's a move more toward Think about the years when Ron Takaki wrote a different mirror and yeah. kind of a multicultural mirror of America. So we were all ethnic groups in that way. But, um, and that's, that was an important moment. Um, but blackness is not an ethnic group. Um, it does not come, it would not immigrant, you know, in terms of the descendants of slaves, we're not immigrants. Um, in the same way that neither are native folks. Native folks are not immigrants, they're not just another ethnic group. Um, you know, we're on indigenous land right now. Um, so we are actually all. <coughs> Settler, you know, clients. So, so there's, there's a different, you can't just put Native Americans and black people and various kinds of Asian Americans and various kinds of black people, and some black people are indigenous folks. And so you can't, it, we're not all positioned in this kind of multiculturally mosaic that I think we spent so many years as that being the dominant frame. Um, and so what does it mean to not, um, to, to theorize specifically, to think about specific locations, then think how those things impact all of us. So it's, it's not a, it's not falling into a racial binary where you know black becomes more important or all race is black. So I think that there is a need for some scholarship that um, is specifically about black people. It doesn't doesn't aim to universalize beyond that. Um, but then we can be in conversation. So like I'm in conversation with indigenous scholars. Like you talked, and she when we're thinking about the relationship between anti-blackness and settler colonialism in specific ways. And then, and then I think that there's a number of scholars who are thinking about. Um, how Latino identity is constructed around colonialism, around whiteness, and around yeah. and, and around blackness to the extent that often we lived in the same neighborhoods or may have been segregated and may have had to form identities. So, but in order to do that work, yeah. um, I rarely, I, black and brown is kind of like an education pol intervention kind of term. Um, I, I only use it in terms of talking about policies that in urban schools, and yeah, you're right, on the East Coast, you know, often a school will be half Puerto Rican and half African American, those would be half, you know, um, West Indian, and then half this or whatever. And so, they, and they speak in those kind of, um, and that's how their interventions work. So it's, it's it is a faulty language to apply beyond, especially in a, any kind of theoretical way. I think. Oh, Thanks for that talk. Oh, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah we met uh, the other day. Uh, my name is Fatawi. Fatawi. Yeah, I'm in sociology. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Sociology. yeah. I'm writing about my um, dissertation on desegregation in Chicago, and I'm really kind of like in conversation with some of these ideas. I'm more focused from the top down on the discourse of desegregation. You know? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you.